<laughs> Come on, Sam. How's it going? All right. So this is uh sorry. Welcome to the Swan Dingo Files. This is the next episode here. I have Travis Johnson on, on with me, a retired Navy pilot, correct? Uh, Naval flight officer. Naval flight officer. Um, so if you just kind of fill us in a little bit about why you even joined the Navy to begin with. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me on the show, Stephen. I always love to see new podcasters get up and get started with whatever their dream is. Uh, doesn't matter what we know, it only matters what we do. So very happy that you took the first step, actually recorded an episode uh, for your intro, and this is your first guest appearance, so very happy to be with that. I really joined the military. Uh, I graduated high school in 99. I was 17. I was working two jobs and a full-time job in Nowheresville, northern Minnesota, and my dad approached me with a job offer. He's like, hey, you should go work it out at the community college. You can be a maintenance guy and then get your boiler tech license and all of this stuff. And I was like, dad, I only got three jobs. Like I don't need another job. He's like, no, no, get rid of those three crappy jobs and get one good job. And I loved his advice, but I didn't like his offer. I couldn't see the future pathway leading from a maintenance guy at a community college to anywhere I could go. He saw it because he knew all the stuff being in the industry. Uh, so I said, you know, I'm going to join the military. I'm going to get the heck out of here, go try to build some kind of life for myself. And I knew right up front, I didn't want to get shot at or carry all my stuff everywhere I went. So Army and Marines were out instantly. Oh, come on. Hey, hey, hey. Come yeah. on now. Hey, <laughs> I, I was a scout, so I, I found that sadly the best part. So that's yeah. Sad. No, I wasn't interested at all. And I went into the Air Force office and the guy stopped me right at the door. He put his hand up and he was like, do you have a criminal record? I said, I started to speak. He's like, is it more than a parking ticket? I was like, yeah, they're like, see you later. Uh, so I wandered mm -hmm. into the Navy office and made sure to delay disclosing my criminal history to them until they had mm -hmm. already bought in on Travis, if you know what I mean. Yep. I was a recruiter, so I know exactly what you mean. So um, so you have quite the past before the Navy. Um, you mentioned that you had two attempted murders. That's right. I had two family members try to snuff me out. Uh, like you bounced around a lot of foster homes. What do you say? 36 homes, five different foster families. Yeah, I moved. I moved 36 times to 12 schools, six states, five different foster homes, eight total. Survived two murder attempts, was homeless twice. So I was a recruiter and people with your kind of past would have never been able to join. Never. So, and I, and I know there's probably stuff that you did do, and I know that some stuff's not going to come up, but with your kind of past, people like you should be in prison. So what drove you to stay at somewhat on straight and narrow enough to be able to even get in the Navy? Because I know you can't hide records. I pulled up records on kids that rap sheets were just crazy. So you had to yeah. stay somewhat on straight and narrow. So what was it that kept you going or kept you from getting in so much trouble that you would have never been able to join. Oh yeah, absolutely. There was a, a couple of things that just flat out refused to do. I didn't do any kind of drugs of any kind. I didn't get into mm -hmm. alcohol. I don't know how I stayed sane during that time period. And I'm sure I wasn't sane the whole time, but mm -hmm. I never got into any other substances, which was really good. good. I had really one hit on my criminal record and I don't know if your listeners can tell this from the way I talk. I can talk my way into and out of just about anything and about any situation. I had to do a, a call with the Admiral of Recruiting Command, who's generally speaking a one-star. And he's like, well, what'd you do? And I explained what I did. And uh, he's like, well, doesn't everyone do that when they're a teenager? So he proved my waiver to get in, which is fantastic. It helps when you score like an 80 on the ASVAB. Uh, I went back and took it a wow. few years later and scored a 98. So that's pretty exciting stuff. Wow, that's really actually impressive. So you, you enlisted in the Navy. Um, how many years before you switch over to the dark side of being an officer? <laughs> I did 11 years. I came in as an E1, got promoted to E6 at my seven-year mark, and then I realized that making chief, making E7 in my rate was really just a pipe dream. The average in my field was 17 years to make E7. 
And boy, was I not interested in putting all my eggs in that basket. But on my nine-year mark, I really looked around to see what was available, what I could do, what could I apply for. And I started applying to officer programs. I applied to the Seaman to Admiral program, which they, if you get accepted, they take you through school full-time, the limited duty officer program, which no degree is required to get commissioned. And I thought if both of those came back uh, belly up, that I would finish my degree and go through the OCS route or OTS, depending on what service. And just so happened that my first application for State 21, they said yes. Went to the University of Oklahoma full-time, got commissioned a year and a half later, finished my degree, yeah, and went to play school. So you are definitely a super motivated person then. Well, in theory, that's true, right? It looks like it. Everyone's got their own motivations. Like I knew... I knew that I could only get promoted. I don't, I don't know how promotions and other services work, but the Navy, you've got twice a year to have a chance to be promoted. Yeah. It, it involves a test, all these different kind of promotion points that you have, what your eval is. And so every time I had the opportunity to get promoted, I doubled down on all the things I knew I needed to do in order to get that stuff done. And I really say my success is due to laziness. <laughs> because every time like a qualification came up, like, I went and got it done, not because I yeah. was motivated, but because I didn't want people to tell me like, hey, you got that call yet? You got that call yet? Every time I heard the leadership walking around asking that to other people, I just cringed inside. Plus, I'm a big fan of using people's anger or hatred towards me as fuel for the next thing. So anyone that told me I couldn't do something, I was like, watch me. Watch this. And get out of my way. I'm going to get it done. Yeah, I don't think I was much different. I knew... uh I mean, I joined on a six six year contract on my first one as a cavalry scout in the army. I was stupid. Well, fun job, don't get me wrong, but they showed me the dune, dune buggies and dirt bike video, and it's like awesome. They don't use those no more. Just to let you know. And uh, but the whole time in, I mean, I did college, I uh, did a bunch of military schools, all the leadership schools, uh, deployed four times, of course. Um, went to South Korea and did recruiter. I checked all the boxes to make sure I got, you know, E7. And I made 7 and 12. Uh, Then some unfortunate circumstances happened and ended up 14 and a half years getting medically retired out. So, but, you know, I ain't gonna lie, though. It was watching other people not make rank, you know, and then me making rank. It's just like, you know, I always told kids or people that are under me, or next to me, this is how you do things, and it's up to them to do it. So, um, mm-hmm. but my privates I always told them keep yourself marketable to the outside world. Um, if you don't make yourself marketable, just doing military service ain't enough. So, especially on the enlisted side, I mean, enlisted members, if you you don't do something while you're in to make yourself marketable to the outside world, you're gonna end up not doing anything. So, oh, that's that's a hundred percent true. I know when I was doing things in the military. I do something every day for the Navy, something every day for my career, and then something every day for myself. Mm-hmm. And that little bit, even a couple of minutes every day, ends up adding up pretty damn quickly. Well, you must have been fairly mentally tough, though. I mean, it's that's a lot of work, especially because I know in the Navy, and actually the Army is probably the easiest one to get promoted, but the Navy, you got to stay tough and you got to keep working for it, and it takes longer to get promoted. So yeah, most people, most people in the military never make it past these six and then that's it. So, um, especially in the other branches. So, but 22 years, huh? 22 years, 11 on each side. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's crazy. I've been retired for a year and a couple of weeks here. Wow. How old are you? 41. Jeez. You don't look that old. <laughs> so, so you, you got as much gray hair as I got going on and I'm like 38. So. But better genes, I guess. I don't know. Must be. I need to go back and kick my dad's butt. But uh, so at, what was the first thing? So when you were transitioning out, I mean, you had a degree. Did you know how how long before you retired did you start the transition process? Years. Oh, years. Wow. Yeah. I was probably I knew I I knew I had to be in until twenty two years, uh, accepting that officer program. Anything that the they give in the officer world. Uh, at least in the Navy, comes with the caveat of you owe more time. Yes. Everything is owe more time. You can do whatever you want, but whatever you sign up for, you owe more time. So I got all my qualifications, 
was an airborne communications officer, was a combat systems officer, was a mission commander and instructor, on a half a billion dollar nuclear command and control <laughs> platform. Jesus. Yeah, you know, did my second instructor tour. You know, got my master training specialist, all those fun things. Started working on my master's degree uh, just a few years into being commissioned. Uh, got that thing completed. I actually went to Bahrain for a year in the Middle East. Oh, wow. And uh, when I got back from that, I did my last two things, but I knew the time commitment. So I made sure that I paid for my last internship and my capstone. I paid for that out of pocket so I wouldn't get saddled with more years. Um, that made the most sense to me. And I had been doing things over the years. I did 10 years about financial planning, helping other families, people at church, people in the, in the Navy handle their finances. And we helped 400 people, uh, 400 families pay off $6 million in debt. So that was pretty gratifying to do. Wow. Oh yeah. Yeah. When you grow up in situations like I do, like ain't no one teaching you how money works, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? No one's wow. teaching you how money works. And when I finally found out some of the things I needed to do to make sure I wasn't a complete train wreck. I was like, how on earth are people not talking about these things? They always have this personal attachment to whatever their financial situation is. I really don't know why that is. We talk about management theory mm -hmm. all the time and no one has problems talking about that, but you talk about money and they're like, Oh no, I don't want to talk about those things. Well, that's the kind of behavior and attitude that keeps people broke. I think with financial stuff, even going from back to high school, people think it's more of a personal accountability thing. But we're, I mean, in in school, we got some a little bit, but in the military, there was no financial planning class, especially getting out. And it's like, that's the biggest piece right there. You And I'm sure you saw you had underlings underneath you. Mm -hmm. I had a kid get a 25% interest rate on a car. It was a 2000 something Monte Carlo. And it's like, really? Like, you should have come and asked, you know, financial mm -hmm. stuff. It's just, it's so important. And I wish they put more of an emphasis on it. Um, the different programs that are out there. Um, I don't know if the Navy has it. The Army has a program that you can start going through, depending on if you're retiring or just getting out. If you're retiring, you can start a year away from retirement. And it's basically a process to help you with um, your resume interviews, mm -hmm. um, start networking a little bit, but they don't teach you networking at all. They just start getting your name out there, <laughs> but there's no real networking. Like I, you're clearly right. good at networking. Um, I mean, your Titan podcast is number top five, so you're clearly good at what you do, but they don't need to hire somebody like you to give them a class on how to teach that because that's more important because it, yeah. it's not what you know. It's, who you, no, it's it's not necessarily what you know; it's who you know to yeah. exceed in life. I, I fully I fully agree. There's so many people that that poured into me over my time in childhood, growing up. There was those couple of people that were willing to help keep me sheltered, clothed, and fed to give me some words of encouragement. You get in the military, and you have mentors all over the place. The Navy you have something called a command financial specialist. These are E sixes and above that go through a special course to teach you how to do some of this stuff. Um, really what it is, is basic monthly household management. And some people know a little bit more than other people, but really it's the bare bones stuff. Um, it's interesting you brought up the 25% car loan because it's only 25% if you pay the minimum every month. If you pay more yes. than the minimum, that percentage goes down. People are like, yes. what do you mean? If I pay it off in one month, I only get a small chunk of, you know, 1%, less than 1% interest. Yeah, this was an E4 private that just got back from deployment. So he blew his wad of money that he got while deployed on the car and going out like many of us do. And <laughs> when he got back, he went went home. I don't know how he got talked into buying that car, but we tried to get him out of it, but it, there was nothing we could honestly do. So, but... Yeah, we don't have any, we have civilians, usually spouses that do financial classes for us, but it's not pushed enough, I don't think. And I really wish they would do that. Yeah, if you don't have a, a solid foundation to build on, I mean, you no. can't do anything. You know, until I went through the healing I needed to go through through my childhood, until I got a, a solid financial base set, until my house was in order, it didn't matter what I did. You're building it on a garbage foundation and really setting those stones and making sure 
it's a solid place to jump off from is huge. A lot of, a lot of officers have the same question. Uh, most of them are in a better situation just by the sheer, you know, paycheck. Yep. And a lot of them, they've already been through college. So they've learned some of this stuff along the way or came from a family with I mean, most, mostly middle-class, some upper middle-class, but you came with a little bit of money and that's a, that's a conversation, right? When, the, when poor people go out and they have a chunk of money and they go buy something, mm -hmm. they go buy liabilities, like a car that's going to cost them a disgusting amount. I never understood the car thing, especially in the Navy. You leave that thing mm -hmm. on the pier to rot near salt water while you're away. Like why get a fancy car? It didn't, didn't make a lot of sense to me. Yeah, I, I was at Dumb Private 2004, first deployment, got back and bought my first vehicle, put rims on it, exhaust, speakers, all that stuff. And yeah, yep. it was gone in like $13,000 in like eight months. And it was like, where did it go? Yeah, I hear you. I definitely hear you. So what was your degree in? At, like, or what'd you get a degree in? Sure. My undergrad, uh, my bachelor's degree was in multidisciplinary studies. It's a very technical degree, not at all. It's basically the only degree I could qualify for. When I got to the program, I had to be commissioned by my 31st birthday. And in order for me to do that, I had to jam as much college as I could into a year and a half. I ended up only going to, to college for five semesters, but the only degree I could walk out of there with was that degree. Other degrees like engineering, you need five years, four years if you really, really do it well. And the other degrees require two or three years worth of, of um, foreign language. I simply didn't have the time to get that done. Uh, my master's degree also from the University of Oklahoma is a master's in human relations. That way I know how to relate to humans. Somewhat, maybe. Uh, you're very good at it, apparently. So, <laughs> excuse me. So as you're transitioning out, uh, what was your biggest worry when you transitioned out? Are you married or have kids or anything? Yeah, I've got a wife and two kids. Um, my biggest worries weren't really anything. When I look at the foundation I built over time, and especially with that Bahrain deployment, I was making uh, 03 ePay, deployed, family SEP, hazardous duty, tech yeah. rezone. I was making almost 15 grand a month tax free. We yeah. paid off every piece of debt that we had. We replaced the air conditioner in the furnace. We poured a third stall drive in the driveway. Uh, we had 50 grand put away at that point. I was doing the podcast. I actually started oh, it in okay. Bahrain. Yeah, which is crazy. We jumped to number four in the U.S. within three months of starting. It's absolutely bananas how that thing took off. So you had no worries at all then, and you're already – I guess they give you a lot of time in the Navy to do what you want, so – not not in the army though. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so well, we we always have that time, and it's just where we put that stuff, right? Yep. Time time spent back in um, in the tent. You can maybe play yeah. some cards or do some things around the fob, or you could go online and meet people, or you could read to help get your knowledge up to where it needed to be. When yep. I was in Bahrain, I read sixty books. I I interviewed I don't know fifty people. I also wow. got to go to Austria and Egypt and Dubai and really, really focus the time that I did have on making myself in the position I needed to be when I get out. I say I wasn't worried. I'm not saying that it wasn't terrible. Every transition has their own terrible story. Mm -hmm. um, but I was doing a good thing. I did the DOD skill bridge. I had this internship I was doing, uh, which they have to offer you a job at the end of it. And it was all going really well for me. And then the January before I retired last day was February 28th last year. Uh, we were set to go out to Johns Hopkins for my wife to have a brain surgery. Um, oh, wow. oh yeah. Yeah. So I'm like, I'm doing the internship. The Navy's got their, their meat hooks out of me. I'm going out to get the surgery done. And uh, she tests positive for COVID and they say surgery's canceled. You can't do it. And we're like, I'm, I'm retiring in like six weeks. Like I don't want to pay any percentage or copay of, you know, brain surgery. And we flew back to yeah. Oklahoma city and almost immediately got another opening and they say, hey, come back out February 10th. We'll get this thing done. Flew out February 10th, got the brain surgery done, got home on like the 18th, uh, got back. And my daughter was like, Hey dad, Jack wants to talk to you. He's in the, the army at, uh, 
he's down in Lot and was at Fort Sill. Yep, I'm not. And I'm not too far from there actually. Yeah. So. Yeah, and I'm in Oklahoma City. I'm right down the road. Oh, so. are you? Oh, okay, yeah. cool. I didn't see that yet. So, yeah, <laughs> you're only an hour and a half, hour forty minutes away from me. So perfect. Yeah, of course. So we get this done. She, he's asking, you know, to marry my daughter, which I knew was coming up. His his school is going to be uh, uh -oh. wrapping up soon. And then we got. She told us that, Dad, we're going to get married in like ten days. And I'm like, so what the, like, what do you need help with? Like, what does that mean? What do you want to do? And wasn't really clear yet. So the last week of my, my active service, my last day was Monday, February 28th. Uh, Tuesday, March 1st was my first day as a civilian. You wake up, you're like, what am I supposed to do? Should I be doing something? How does this work? You got my DD-214 in my email that morning, which was great. Uh, I had taken my son out for dinner because he had been missing us because we were gone for essentially, you know, two months. And I got home and my wife, who's recovering from brain surgery, was rearranging the back patio, had been up in the attic and all these different things. And I lost it. I was like, what on earth are you doing? Like if you would have slipped and fell and busted your head while I was mm -hmm. gone, this, that, and the other, uh, I, I lost it. I got my truck a little bit, went for a drive around town, called my dad, you know, <laughs> trying to figure out what to do. And I just vomited out of the mouth, just told him all this stuff. Um, I had gotten a job offer from the DOD skill bridge partner and the offer was for seven twenty five an hour for 20 hours a week. So I'm staring at a wife that just had brain surgery. She's not working. My job offer fell through. I'm not working. I'm not getting paid. Um, my daughter's getting married uh, five days from that point. They're getting, she's getting married on Saturday, four days at that point. And my wife's going crazy, right? So he's like, yeah, let me let me hang up and, and think about it just for a minute, and I'll get back to you. So I then I called another friend and just told him the exact same story I just told my dad. My dad chimed back in. I got on the horn. He's like, you know, have you ever been able to tell your wife what to do? I was like, no. He's like, what makes you think you can now? And I'm like, that's true. Okay, fine. I was like, what else do you got? He's like, let's not pretend your daughter getting married this weekend isn't a huge gift. And I was like, okay, I'm listening. Sell me on this. And he's like, did you spend $30,000 on the wedding? I said, no. He's like, did you go through wedding appointments every weekend for 10 months. I said, no, he's like, sounds like you're getting off kind of easy. I was like, okay, calm back down a little bit. Wednesday comes, uh, my wife's grandma turns 91 Thursday. Grandma dies in Minnesota. Jesus, It's everything is going crazy, right? Friday, mm -hmm. people are starting to come in for the wedding and different things. Friday, I get word that my podcast course, ultimate podcast course has been approved and is available at Forbes business school. So I have an accredited podcast course Saturday morning. My daughter gets married and then Saturday night, my retirement party. So we had over 200 people at the house that day, but that was all like one week. That's a lot. I think I would have lost it if I was you. I honestly would have lost it. Yeah. It's insane. That's pretty cool though. You got the podcast at Forbes. Um, I didn't know that was even possible, honestly. So <laughs> I'm still learning a lot. There's so much stuff that I've never even heard of or learned. And, the, and it seems like these veterans out here are just, they're learning stuff and they're just expanding on it a lot, kind of like yourself. Yeah. So, so, but I see you're now doing very well. Uh, what other ventures are you into besides just the podcast? Yeah. So we've got, a, we've got a couple of shows and we're doing one is the Titan Evolution podcast that you mentioned a little bit ago. I have two shows in the top five globally. Uh, even though I'm not producing the nonprofit architect podcast, it's still, I get an email every day, say it's charting in some other country. <laughs> it was in the U S it was charting in Australia this week. Uh, last That's week awesome. it was charting again in Canada. And I'm like, people are still listening to that stuff. It's good. When you provide value and actually teach people yeah. things like they come back they come back for more. Uh, we're doing the podcast Titan and I realize I use Titan in two different things I'm doing, which makes it a little confusing, but that's a business where we do, uh, we have all the books that I've written, the courses available. So if you're a DIYer and you want to get started on podcasting, go to podcasttitan.com, get one of the five books that I wrote about podcasting, depending on what you need, need at the time, or take the course online. It's self-paced. And if you're in one of the three universities that's attached to you, you actually can get 
college credit for taking my course, which is just bananas to me. You know, I'm just a trailer park and foster care kid and I've got an accredited course and three universities. Just every time I say it, it just like blows my mind because it's not like I walk around like thinking that stuff, right? It comes out in interviews and I'm like, oh yeah, I did do that. <laughs> well, hey, sometimes you just got to remind yourself of your success. So absolutely. Always... And then uh, podcast Titan, we also do actually full service production. So we do, you know, editing, posting, show notes, the full transcription we put on YouTube for you. We create a blog post. We give you seven audiograms or video clips to use on your social media. Heck, we even got a gal that will run your social media for you if that's what you need. It's just, mm. it's not even been a year that I've been doing that stuff. I'm already past where I thought I could possibly mm. be. You know what I mean? It's just absolutely crazy. And then we also offer training, actual podcast coaching where I'll come in. Like with you, we'll go over, it's a six month deal. We'll go over two topics every time that we meet and then unlimited emails and touch points to help you get better during that time. So you really are making sure that you're maximizing the thing that you're doing with your show. So you actually take a full hands-on approach to every, everybody you deal with. So it's not, because there's a lot of people out there that are like, well, I'll help you do this, this, and this. And then people fall to the wayside. Like I've been through a few programs of different things since I started this and it's learn on your own and we'll get to you when we get to you. So yeah. that's what it's kind of like. And it's, Unfortunately, I'm seeing a lot of veterans get into these programs where I know a lot of it's in the marketing right now where they're getting into these coaching programs for marketing and it's, they're not getting taught anything. Um, right. And it's right. sad. So it's nice to see. And I, that's what I like veterans because it seems like the veterans are really, really will grab a hold of one another and make sure they guide them through what they need to be successful. I mean, it's still on you, of course, to be successful. It, it is still on you. Way. There's definitely some veterans that are doing it the other way too, but you know, like the things that I create, like the books that I wrote, it doesn't just tell you what to do. It tells you how to implement it and why it matters. Yeah. Like I don't want to, I don't want anyone to get anything that I've created and I'll walk away and, and mention it like you're mentioning it. Like, yeah, really felt like I got, you know, taken for a ride. There's not really any value there. Like that stuff makes me cringe. Like I can't possibly, some people tell me like, Hey, you put way too much stuff in these books. Like you should be charging a lot more. I'm like, I get it, but it's, it's set at a premium. So people know it's not nothing. And when they get in there, they feel like they've gotten, you know, given the world as to what to do and what to expect and how to do it. Okay. Uh, so uh, just a quick little wrap up here. So what, so you transitioned out, you become very successful. Um, clearly people know you around the world. You got a big following um veterans look to you uh including myself what is your what would you tell veterans when they're getting out you know what what should they be doing before they get out of the military to make their transition easier and better absolutely it's a great question there's a couple of things that i run through that i was running through with all of my guys before i actually retired uh one of the things is what thing do you need to create a life that you want? Is there some kind of degree, some kind of certification, some kind of experience that you need to go be successful in that? Then the question becomes, you know, what do you want your actual day to look like? And can you build something that's going to mirror up with that? You can walk out and go get, get, get a government job and basically continue operating the way you were. You can get out, you can start your own business. You can get into franchising. There's so many things available to us. It's almost overwhelming that we have so many different options. And then really figuring out who do you need to meet and know along the way. I know a lot of people cringe when you talk about something like networking. And the reason that is most people think of networking, what they're really doing and what they're really experiencing with those people is prospecting. People are going around trying to qualify people for work. And if you're out there prospecting and calling it networking, just stop. Like you're making it gross for everybody. Networking is really getting to know someone, providing value figuring out how you can connect them to either a person or a resource to make them successful and being that person that is a connector. That's what networking really is, is figuring out how can we provide value to each other so everybody can win. I know I didn't have that mindset when I was in the trailer park. I didn't have that mindset when I was in foster care. I didn't have that mindset when I was a junior enlisted guy. In fact, this guy was an ass. <laughs> I know I was. 
Everyone, everyone that knew me when I was enlisted and they only saw me for that little fragment of time, yeah. like my name comes up or they see me speaking on stage, they're like, that guy's a jerk. Like, what is he doing up there? I'm not a jerk anymore. Or if I am, most people are okay with it now. <laughs> well, you got a lot of good advice to give. And I do really appreciate you jumping on here with me. I do eventually want to get on um, another meeting at some point um, because you, you have a lot of good information to give and I need some more information and I would like to pick your brain some more at some point as I continue my journey. Um, but it was a pleasure talking to you. Uh, Travis, um, I hope we can get on again and I uh, keep crushing it. So I really appreciate that, Stephen. If you want to get a hold of me, you want to figure out mm -hmm. who I am, what am I doing, and where you can connect with me at, go to Linktree, type in Travis D. Johnson. That's Linktree, L I N K T R dot E E slash Travis D. Johnson. You'll have all my links there to connect with me on social media. Send me an email. Find my podcast, find my stuff. Everything is that one link. Thanks again, Stephen.